Hey guys, it's Matt. Today we're going to talk about 1031 exchanges. They can seem very complicated, and they are somewhat complicated, but I'm going to tell you everything that I know and just hopefully everything that you need to know about these types of transactions and how you can utilize them when you're selling your real estate. So, let's jump into it. So, for those of you that don't know, here's what a 1031 exchange is, okay? Let's say you've got a piece of rental real estate, and I need to accentuate the word rental. We'll get into that in just a minute. Let's say you've got a piece of rental real estate right here. That's a cute little house. Let's put a little smokestack on it. There you go. Okay. All right. So there's your rental real estate. And this could be a single family home. This could be an apartment building. This could be a shopping center. This could be a mixed use building. Anything, any type of real estate, even land. It could be any type of, of real estate that you own. Um, Check on that land thing, by the way. I'm not sure, because land, I'm not sure if it qualifies for investment intent. So put an asterisk next to that one. But I have done 1031 exchanges for smaller properties, duplexes, and um, small, mid-sized multi as well. So let's stick to that. But it can be commercial as well. And um, in that the purpose of a 1031 exchange is selling this property and keeping all the proceeds from the sale and rolling it into a next a purchase up into, into you know bigger property because if you don't do a 1031 exchange you're going to pay income tax on the sale of the properties let's say you bought this property for 100k you held it for five years you held it for however long you did and you can now sell it due to market improvements and because you're an awesome landlord and you've increased uh, the revenue for the property and somebody's willing to pay you a higher price on a, on a good market cap rate for the property and because you've increased the profitability of the deal um, it's worth more so let's say you're going to sell it for two hundred thousand okay so you also uh, your that that gain right there of a hundred thousand dollars is taxable um, and it's taxed at you know fairly aggressive rates so you'd rather uh, rather not have to pay that tax, I'm sure, and just transfer all that money into your next deal. There's more tax involved in a 1031 exchange as well because, as some of you know, as you hold real estate, you get to depreciate it. So uh, the IRS is going to say, okay, you started out at 100. We're going to allow you to write off value of that property every year to where on your books, after just a couple of years, it's only worth, let's say, 85 k So that $15,000 is depreciation that you've gotten to write off your books every couple of years. You get to uh, reduce the value of your investment by a couple of thousand a year, which is really great because if you made a couple of grand, but you get to reduce the value by a couple of grand, you make net zero or even net negative uh, from a tax perspective. Depreciation is a great, great thing. But when you go to sell the property, the IRS isn't stupid. They realize, hey, wait a minute. He sold it for 200000 We only have it on his books for eighty five. So he has to pay gain, not on just that $100,000, but on this depreciation. You got to write off your books, but you actually didn't lose the value of the property. You actually have to pay up for the depreciation that you got to write off. It's called depreciation recapture. Okay? So these are all things that you would want to avoid. So that's why a 1031 exchange is even something you would want to do, okay? So here's what a 1031 exchange is. Here's the nuts and bolts of it real quick. So you're going to sell this property, and you are going to, like I said, transfer all of these proceeds, all of them. You can't take a dime and put it in your own pocket, and you're going to go and buy a bigger asset over here. And I'm going to make it physically bigger so you can see that it's bigger, right? It's got even more windows. And it's still got a little smokestack at the top. And it's got a couple of doors on it. Okay? So you're going at my very first 1031 exchange, we sold a duplex and we bought a four family uh, building. That was our very first one. Um, so let's pretend that's the same thing here. Now, here are some of the rules for 1031 exchanges, and I'll use my awesome art drawing here to, uh, to implement it, to tell you about those rules. So uh, the first thing is, it has to be a qualified deal. That's the first thing. So for all you fix and flippers out there, they're like, oh man, this is awesome. I'm just going to do 1031 exchanges every time I flip a house. No, you can't do that. Because a 1031 exchange has to, very first, this first property has to have investment intent. You have to be able to show the IRS that you had investment intent the whole time when you were involved in the property. So that means that, that might, there might need to, you might need to show leases rental income, 
um, that you improve the property. Of course, you can show that you invested in the property and you fixed it up, but you also have to show that those investments were made for um, investment, rental income, passive income intent on the property, not value add so that I can sell it. Now, you can go out and buy a vacated or a dilapidated duplex and do the Burr strategy, the strategy, the BRRRR, right? You can go and buy a duplex and fix it up and make investments in the property and then put tenants in and then go and sell it. And in the back of your head, you might have intended to do that the whole time, kind of like, a, like flipping a rental property, which is something common that people do. But the things that you did on the property were always investment intent. If you're going to do something like that, if you're going to go flip a small multi, I highly recommend that you hold it for a little while, you know, a couple months uh, with tenants in there so that you can qualify for a 1031 exchange when you sell it. So again, it has to be, it has to be a property that has straight investment intent and you can change your mind later and decide to sell it. But it cannot be a property that you went out and bought and renovated and sold and you never leased it. No evidence of any, of any passive income intent on the property um, ever. So that means it's a, if it doesn't uh, fit those and if it's just an investment deal, then it's a qualified deal. So that's number one, it has to qualify. Um, number two, the owner of this property has to be the owner of that property. It sounds silly, but here's what that really means. Um, when my wife Liz and I first bought our duplex, we bought it, we were actually dating at the time, so we bought it in her maiden name and my personal name because we were awesome and didn't have an LLC set up at the time and there wasn't anything like bigger pockets out there to tell us what to do, right? So we bought it in our personal name. Well, guess what we had to do over here? We had to buy that in our personal name too. It has to be in this held in the same title and it also has to be held in the exact same title. So for years, we owned a four family with my wife's maiden name on it, even though we had you know, been married for years at that point, right? Um, because it has to be held in the same title as this property. Now, after the 1031 exchange settled, we decided we, we wanted to refinance the building years later. And so we did a uh, quick claim deed, which is a whole other conversation, which we're not going to have here. But we quick claim deeded it out of our personal name into an LLC later. But bottom line, this ownership entity has to be the same as the ownership entity that's buying that property, the exact same. So you can't have one, two, three LLC that's going to sell this property and then invest in a fund or a syndication or something larger that's with another owner or other people or whatever it is, it has to be the exact same owner. Okay, got it? All right, good. Um, now, you, uh, here's the timeline for a 1031 exchange. And this is where people get tripped up and this is where a lot of questions happen. I'll do my best to explain this to you guys uh, very clearly. So. When you, when you are considering selling this property, first of all, you should hi, I highly recommend you engage a third party called a qualified intermediary. Uh, some people also call them 1031 escrow agents. Some people call them um, uh, just account holders or uh, custodians. But the, the correct term that I've heard is qualified intermediary for a 1031 exchange. This QI comes in and when this property sells, None of this money even touches your pocket. It goes from settlement into the pocket of the QI who is a qualified intermediary and they can talk you through the whole process and they hold the money and then when the money comes, the money needs to go invest it into this deal, the qualified intermediary comes to closing or wires it to the title company for this deal. So the money actually never touches your pocket. It just goes to the intermediary. That's rule number one. Here's the timing. In 45 days, from you selling this property, 45 days from closing, you have to identify through the qualified intermediary, intermediary and you know, through them to the IRS, right? You have to identify up to three potential purchases that you're going to make. 45 days is like a blink of an eye in, the, in real estate time, okay? Um, like seven years is dog, you know, seven years in dog years. Well, in real estate time, that's like nothing. Uh, 45 days. So what I recommend if you guys are going to go selling property, you better be thinking about what your property, what your potential properties you're going to be buying are before you even put this property up for sale, right? Most people that I know that do 1031 exchanges, the day they put this up for sale, they already have this under contract, right? If you really want to play the game the right way. Now, let's say you don't. Let's say that you have an unexpected buyer of this property and you decide you want to do a 1031 exchange late in the game, and then you have to abide by this calendar. So 45 days from here, you have to identify 
uh, potential purchases, okay? You don't have to buy you know, the exact property, but you have to identify potential purchases, and you have to buy at least, you have to, this property has to be one of the potential purchases, and you're allowed to identify three. What I mean, what I'm kind of saying in a roundabout way, is that it doesn't have to be number one, it doesn't have to be number two, but it better be number three if it's not number one or number two. So they could be, they could all be possibilities of purchases. Now, the rules get a little more complicated. I'm not going to get into it right now, but you can also say, I'm going to take the pro this $135,000 in proceeds and I'm going to buy this property, this property, and this property. Um, you're, you're going to break the money up and buy multiple properties. You can do that. There's more rules around that too, um, which again, beyond the scope of, a, uh, of, of this video. But today, what I'll tell you is you can identify one two or up to three potential purchases of which your final purchase has to be one of those three. Okay? Now, here's the other calendar. In 180 days, you must purchase this, third, this, this property, the new property, which again has to be one of the ones you identified. Okay? So you have to close and own it in 180 days. So people are like, well, what if, I don't, what if I don't buy it? What if I don't close? Can I get an extension? No. The IRS is very tight about this. You can't get an extension. You cannot extend this out. If it goes to 181, 181 days or longer, or whatever it is, oh, I can't, you can't file for an extension. I can get an extension on my taxes now for some reason or another. They're not giving anything on this. So if you go past that date, you pay tax on this money. That's what it is. That's why. That's the way I understand it. Now, I'm sure I'll get some comments below on ways you can circumvent the 180. I, I welcome those comments and those conversations. But the way I understand it is, 100. Uh, uh, you, th this this profit here becomes taxable if you go past 180. Period. The end. Now, for those of you that are uh, that are asking, well, what if you fall through? Well, here's what you do. Here, here's your your backup plan. You got to put it back. Here's your maybe the little the secret here that, that the some of the bigger folks in this business have taught me is uh, yes you identify properties and just you, you don't be silly you start your search for the new property here okay before you sell this property and you don't close the sale of this property until you have this identified that's number one so you know where you're going before you even close this thing so you could identify the new property right after closing okay that's the best way to do it now, you also can build yourself in a safety net in, the, in that 45 day in, in the properties that you identify are potentials. And there is something called tenants in common. Tenants in common investments. And they've got, a, they've got kind of a funky uh, reputation out there. They're, they're very complicated. But what it's, in general, what tenants in common are is you and a collection, a collection of other people uh, get together through, through an organizer, a syndicator of a tenants in common investment, and you go out and buy the Empire State Building, something enormous, like a big office complex, a big shopping mall, something like that. And you, along with these other people, have undivided interest in that property. And so you get your own little deed that says you own, you know, 0.3% of the King of Prussia Mall, congratulations, or 0.2% of the Chrysler Building. Awesome. Here's your deed for the Chrysler for 0.2% of the Chrysler building, and and that's all yours. And you can actually liquidate your one owner percent ownership, that 2.2% ownership. It gets squirrely, and a lot of people don't like them because there is a relation you have to have to the other people, and it has to do who's managing the property, and it's very hard to uh, change the direction of those kinds of properties if you find they're not being run very well because you only have 0.2%. But if you find one that's run really well, you can do a 1031 exchange into a tenants in common investment. Okay? What you want to do is have that as your backup plan. So that is your safety net. You want to have like awesome multifamily building that's going to produce lots of cash for yourself or the strip center or the smattering of single family homes or whatever it is uh, that's your A number one priority. And then just have your backup plan here. Always have a safety net built into your 45-day identification. Okay, that's what you want to do. Because a lot of people ask me, what do you do if your if your 1031 falls through? The people that know that you can't go past this 180 days, it gets a little scary to figure what kind of tax you might have to pay. Because some of these folks are selling properties that they've owned for a very long time, and they might be looking at a way larger gain than $100,000. They could be looking at you know millions of uh, of uh, dollars to be paying. In, uh, in, on, on sales proceeds. 
Another thing people get themselves into outside of tenants in common are triple net properties. Uh, triple net is like buying a Walgreens, buying the building that a Walgreens is in or buying the land underneath a Kentucky Fried Chicken or something like that. Something that's, that's leased by an enormous company that's never going to go anywhere and you've got the corporate company on the lease so you're good to go forever. Uh, you could do a triple net. If you've got a large amount of money, you're going to do a 1031 exchange into. Um, but I would look for like a, like, a, like a good premier asset as the number one thing you want to get yourself into. And if that falls through, you maybe fall back on a tenants in common or a triple net. Um, so I, I hope I didn't glaze your eyes over or make your head spin. Uh, I know it's a, it's a little longer video, but I hope, uh, hope it was of value. This is 1031 exchange. This is a great way to uh, leverage your, uh, your sales on properties. We've done them a few times. It, we've always been able to trade up into way larger assets when we do them, so um, this is a great vehicle. I hope, I, made, I hope it made sense. Hope you guys, my awesome pictures up here, uh, illustrated the whole thing for you. As always, as you guys know, I love comments down below, so leave comments. Let's get some chatter going on on these things, and please feel free to expand on some things that I said, or even uh, refute it, challenge it. I love to be challenged. It's okay. We'll have a little conversation about those things. So um, as always, guys, I really appreciate you. Thank you for watching and have a great and profitable week.